This is Fact Checking Space Force, the show, not the agency. I'm your host, Kasha Patel. And today we're delving into the science behind episode one of Space Force called The Launch. Today's guest is Bob Ackfordowski. He's an engineer at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California for almost 17 years. He worked on the Mars Curiosity rover, which launched in 2011, and he's also known as the Mohawk guy. That's me. Thank you for joining me. Tell us a little more about what you do. Um, I specifically focus on an area called fault protection, which is how our spacecraft can break and uh, try to design, of course, as much of that out of the system as possible. And for the parts that we, of course, can't be perfect on, um, we uh, try to design in the system all the autonomy to take care of itself. All right. So what did you think about the first episode? I was expecting a much, you know, more of a, of a I think, a, a traditional sitcom. Did you uh, watch The Office? Yes. Did you yes. like The Office? I did, yeah, I liked The Office. It definitely wasn't The Office. <laughs> <laughs> definitely was not Space Office, no. <laughs> right. All right, cool. Uh, so let's get into it. Three, two, one, play. So I actually heard on the podcast that they did about this, um, Netflix commissioned this. It wasn't that somebody had an idea for, it wasn't like Steve Carell had an idea for Space Force. Netflix commissioned this and asked Steve Carell and his co-directors if they could be part of this. I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, it was, it's very weird. I also, I received a couple of emails uh, not long after this show was announced, uh, asking if I could, was able to go into the writer's room. And oh. for whatever reason, I, I don't, you know, I, I, what I recall was being excited, sending an email out, and then for whatever reason, we could never, either it never came to fruition or I was never able to, to make it in. But I don't remember us scheduling anything. So I think it was just one of those things where they were excited at first, they wanted somebody, maybe they went in a different direction, and then they were like, oh yeah, we're, we're good. Well, consider this your audition for season two. Oh so you no, better, this is a lot. A lot <laughs> you better of kill it now, so <laughs> then they'll email you back, the assistant to the director, whatever it is. <laughs> right. POTUS wants complete space dominance. So right now we're watching this scene where they're talking about the creation of Space Force. When you first heard of Space Force, what did you think? Did you think, nah, this will never happen? Or you were like, oh, that sounds cool. I could see myself working for Space Force. I mean, so I think I was probably more informed than most people um, in what I expected it to be. And I thought, oh, this is an existing thing that is just largely rebranding the US um, Air Force Space Command mm -hmm. into Space Force, uh, which is very much what it still seems to be as far as I can tell at this point. But um, yeah, I was like, okay, it's a, uh, I, I, uh, more than anything, I felt like that's a weird branding choice. Like Space Force feels like somebody, somebody in the room should have said like, they're going to make fun of you for calling it Space Force. <laughs> so there's actually, I just found this out, Fred Willard, who's in this 2020 Space Force, he right. was actually in an original Space Force from like 1978 that's like super grainy and it takes place in space and it's kind of, it's nothing like this. We keep the galaxy from getting worse Always Johnny on the spot We're the Space Force and Ace Force That sounds great. Big launch today, huh? Launch? At the new base. What base? I was going to say, so I like this scene where he's talking with this gas station attendant and he's like, oh, it's a secret, right? What's one of the weirdest interactions that you've had with somebody? Like, I think the weirdest one was a moon, a person who, uh, who had been at a party with a, an Apollo astronaut. And she was convinced that she had gotten some sort of lunar disease from this person. Like, she's like, you know, after I met this person, my health started to go downhill. Um, I mean... Yeah, and then she was like, you know, do you know of any lunar, like, who can I talk to? I've tried calling many people at NASA about this. Uh, and then, I mean, it was apparent more, you know, afterwards, that the, you know, the conversation, maybe that was obvious enough, but, you know, there are other points in the conversation where she's like, well, 
And also, you know, I think, I think they know it's real because whenever the president comes to town, my cell phone stops working. Um, and I was like, that seems like a lot of leaps of, of logic here. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so for whatever reason, uh, I think that was one of the weirdest interactions. For all of you at home wondering if there's a lunar disease, as far as Bobak and I know, there is not. But there is research that shows Apollo astronauts are more likely to die from a heart disease. And now back to the show. What a random place to have Space Force Base. I mean, I guess it needs to be pretty big. So there is the Air Force, uh, pretty large Air Force installation at Colorado Springs, which is what I thought maybe they were kind of going for. Ah. I mean, it's certainly not a good place to launch from, right? So we always want to launch <laughs> over water where it's safest to, you know, if stuff falls down. Or you see the Chinese space program, like where there's parts of the rockets that fall on cities below it or towns below it. Right, right. Um, Definitely want to avoid that. Right. Also, this was almost 100% clear to me that this is shot in California uh, in the Angeles National Forest, which is only maybe a 20 minute drive from, from Pasadena. <laughs> I was like, this is LA. <laughs> that is one of the problems with living in this city, I think, is you start recognizing all the, like, the, the shows. They're like, oh, that's the Fox lot. That's LA. That's, you know. <laughs> that's funny because to me, I'm like, I don't know. This could be anywhere. I don't have anything like this in DC. <laughs> We need to cancel the launch. No. Dr. Mallory here is talking about how they need to cancel the launch. So tell us about the process. What was your role in the launch that you were involved in? So I helped write the um, procedure for Curiosity when we um, launched, which was basically the checklist of uh, commands we had to send before launch. Uh, and then um, basically the configuration changes that, you know, that we were going to make as, as we were we got ready for the countdown, and then a little bit of what the spacecraft would reconfigure itself all autonomously um, from the, you know, the liftoff all the way up to separation from uh, the launch vehicle. Um, so I didn't, you know, of course, what they're talking about here is the, the rocket itself um, and whether the rocket can safely launch, not the payload inside the rocket. Right. Uh, so that's the, you know, the, the, the challenge there. Um, so there's really two teams, right, or many teams, but the two large teams are, you know, the rocket safety, of course, and then the, um, the, the payload team that's trying to make sure that, you know, their payload is ready to go. And so I obviously, you know, worked only on the payload and Lock Lockheed or ULA, United Launch Alliance, was the rocket provider for, for Curiosity. Uh, okay. For rockets, there's the, what we call instantaneous launch window, which mm -hmm. is sometimes where you can only launch specifically at that time in order to perfectly make a rendezvous, right, with like a space station. Um, with the the atlas that we were flying on, they can do some maneuvering um, in the in the flight in order to slightly adjust that timing. Right? It's because I, the big thing that people kind of forget about space is that both objects are moving, and so it's not just arriving at the same place; it's also arriving at the same place and time. Otherwise, the other one will have moved on, right? Like it's not like me going to Florida. Florida's not moving relative to me at this time. But if Florida was also moving, right? If you think football, throwing a ball. You have to throw a ball to not where the person is catching it now, but where they're going to be, right. you know, by the time the ball arrives. And that's the trick with rockets is if the rocket has some ability to kind of maneuver, right? Like if my football could also like fly itself, it'd be great. Cause then I could just throw it generally <laughs> and it would just like kind of get to the guy. Um, but in, in some cases it's a lot tough. That's easier, you know, easier said than done. Um, that kind of onboard ability is, is pretty challenging. And so not every rocket builds it in or, um, it comes at a price of, of efficiency, right? So you're spending extra fuel to do that. And some missions are very much kind of with no margin or very little margin on the fuel. So they have to do like this. You get one chance every 12 hours to launch. And if you miss that, you know, literally that second, there was lightning around, then come back 12 hours later and try it again. All right. That would definitely make football more interesting if you could control the football <laughs> while it's in the air. <laughs> I feel like that's coming, right? Like there's going to be some future robotic like football or sport where like there's going to be an in like in motion aspect that's no longer just simple physics. 
Can you imagine what the hashtag for that would be? What was it last time? Deflate gate for uh, the Super Bowl? Man, this would be a complete <laughs> disaster. <laughs> I think um, I want to say that, I mean, so, you know, I mean, obviously people do interesting things with it, right? Because uh, like soccer balls and things like that, right? They can slice. Um, you can actually use, or golf balls, you can actually use the, the physics of it to, to, right, essentially to kind of deviate. I think, you know, I, I played Frisbee um, uh, and, you know, you can, right, the amount of spin you put on and everything else can also change the, the trajectory. Obviously, once it's in motion, you can't affect it anymore, but. Yeah, um, you know, a lot of sports do take advantage of those things, of like of, of kind of the additional forces that can be generated in flight um, to to bend the trajectory, right? Like the the whole bend it like Beckham kind of thing, right? Which is oh, putting yeah, a spin yeah. on the ball to to make it actually curve, um, which is pretty cool. Like if you think about the like the additional layer of physics that's on that. Yeah. Wait. So you played frisbee? I played frisbee. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I played, played frisbee in, golf and ultimate frisbee. Actually, at NASA Goddard, there's a frisbee club. So oh, we nice. play every Tuesday and Thursday. And I actually wrote an article for USA Ultimate about Frisbee in the government. So I wrote about it in uh, at NASA. I knew a guy who was in the Navy and they played it over in Bahrain. Um, yeah. A lot of places, a lot of branches play Frisbee. Mostly it seems like JPL's big sport is softball. Uh, I don't know if that's yeah. also a thing. Yeah, we have uh, yeah softball's big. Uh, I know we have a softball league at Goddard, but I don't play soft. I don't know much about it. So I think it's good because it it's pretty easy to play at all ages. <laughs> like you can right, like even as you're you know sixty something years old working, softball is still pretty approachable. Yeah, for the most part, which is nice. Right, it's a nice like common common denominator game for for places yeah. like large organizations like us. I think ultimate. I you know I can't. I've not seen a lot of sixty year olds playing ultimate. Oh, there are definitely a lot Are of, they? Uh, well, so here's the thing about Frisbee. Um, the young people are the runners, and then you have these older right. people who just, like, throw at the entire yeah, yeah, yeah. field. So you, you have your roles. <laughs> okay. Okay, I can see that. <laughs> cool. I don't like to pull rank, but oh. I order you to postpone the launch, okay? There's too much moisture in the air. We prefer a less ionized environment. So yeah, they're talking about the, the atmospheric conditions. Um, and, the, and they're right, right? Like at some level, all these things are a risk game. Um, you know, you can launch in those conditions and it might be pretty good chances. But again, if, depending on how much money you've spent and how important this mission is and whether you can build backups, uh, you might... Right, you you might be aiming for something like a ninety five percent confidence level or even higher. Who's the person that ultimately decides not to launch? Uh, I I want to say there is a a director. Usually there there's a one of the senior NASA directors gives the go, um, but a, a lot of people can kind of call it off, right? Like a lot of people have sort of veto power at the end of the day, hmm. uh, right? So like the payload um, manager could say, you know, our conditions aren't ready. The launch vehicle could say they're not ready. Weather folks could say they're not ready. The launch was cropped. That is not accurate, Yuri. Call me Bobby. It's more reassuring. Can I see technical specifications for the Epsilon Part E16F fuel pump? Why would you need to see that? Well, as observer from ISS partner country, I just want to observe it. This was weird, the, uh, the Russian sort of counterpart. There are examples of this, though. Um, so for the uh, rockets that are converted from missiles, um, which both parties have done, both the, the former Soviet Union and, and now, now, uh, Russian and the U.S. have converted old uh, missiles into rock rockets, they have, uh, for the arms treaty requirements, they actually do have to share information. Um, so you do have to provide like telemetry data to the other parties to prove that it is actually a, a rocket and not a missile that you're launching. Huh. Um, so I guess there's some some aspects of this that could be kind of seen as true. Huh. I don't know I if they have not. a person standing there like that. I think there's more of a like, hey, we're going to launch this at this time. Here's what you need to know. And hmm. but... Hey, looks good. Yeah. Sweet. Very sleek. Like the elephant. Mm -hmm. I love the idea that somehow your campus is so close to a rocket a site like this. <laughs> Like that you're, uh, I don't know, 200 feet away from rocket. That sounds amazing. Right? <laughs> like they're just going their little bunker and they can see it yeah. like that. I wish this were the case so much. Um, 
I feel like very fortunate, you know, because we have Vandenberg Air Force Base, which is two hours north of us. And so on, a, on good, you know, days, and we've seen it, right? You can see SpaceX launches out of there or, you know, um, Lockheed launches out of there, uh, kind of traveling south along the, the coastline. Um, and it's pretty awesome. But uh, yeah, the, of course, my you know friends in Orlando are just like, we see rockets all the time. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> Well, it's funny because like, so we're talking about how close they are. So what I was at Wallops, I've only seen only, I mean, I've seen two launches, which was like enough for, I mean, I'm happy. I can die happy now. Um, <laughs> but one of them was in Kennedy. The other one is in Wallops. And for Wallops, I think the closest we could get was about four miles away, um, which is pretty good. But even that far away... Like you could still, I mean, the noise and like you could feel the ground moving. Right. That's why we have acoustic tests and things for that. That if you were that close, what would you actually experience? I mean, I think obviously the, uh, I can't imagine that a lot of structures are designed to handle that much vibration. Right, like concrete especially would probably just start crumbling. Uh, well, you know, I mean, the, the, the bunkers were not very far from the launch pads, um, but they are really curved shapes, right? That are like mostly buried underground. And I'm trying to remember if any or many of them have windows in them at all. Um, but, you know, like it is impressive if you watch the footage from the shuttle and uh, Apollo before it, right? They do have those cameras that are sitting 20 feet away under thick quartz glass or whatever, right? That are filming these things and manage to not tear apart. I think the bigger concern would, of course, just be the, you know, things blowing up and then you just have Right. Like he, that's why humans are usually miles. I think the require. I can't remember what our requirement was, but there is a requirement that you know basically when you arm like the final kind of arming stuff, mm -hmm. that people are I think a minimum of two miles away, um, for that. Yeah, I remember for another Wallops launch, and this got put in the papers. Uh, <laughs> the NASA photographer when the rocket went up, it was successful. It didn't blow up or anything. But when it went up, there was a frog that was yes. clearly in the picture and that was yeah it's pretty amazing also i've I mean, people i've seen people put their cameras pretty close to launch pads and they definitely have burnt elements or lenses that melt or things like that from the heat of it so oh, that's yeah. another i mean that's why those like quartz glass things were you know i don't know inches thick basically to to shield from the heat of, of yeah. the, the rocket uh, plumes yeah, and I've seen fires happen on the bushes around just because, I mean, there's a lot of sparks and stuff going on. Right. So. Hmm. I like this part. He's talking to these high school, middle school students, and look how sparsely attended it is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I will say that, like, having done this a fair amount, I would actually say most of the time it's more, people are more excited. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're someone from, I mean, NASA or Space Force. I mean... Both of those things are very exciting because they have to do with space. Boots on the Moon. Boots on the Moon is also now a Ben and Jerry's flavor. Do you guys have a fancy cafeteria? I don't feel like we have one of those. Like we, we... just have, like, as far as I know, the regular cafeterias. Yeah, no, we don't have anything nice like this. I know headquarters has like a nicer one. They have the regular cafeteria, then they have like a nicer buffet one. But no, okay. we don't have anything like this. Yeah. Have you been to NASA headquarters? I have. Yeah, m many times now. Um, it's which pretty is, boring. It, I was going to say, it's the, I would say it's unfortunately the saddest of the experiences, <laughs> I feel like, if you, like for, for NASA, because everybody else at least has some hardware or something that they can kind of be like, this is what we do. Right. And I actually, I, I got to say, like, I think it's actually almost a testament to the folks who work there that they can still be, like, motivated and passionate about it <laughs> while just kind of being in an office building. Right. But they do get the food trucks there. So that's true. They do yeah. get better food than a lot of us. <laughs> yeah. I feel like at one point, um, JPL had the kind of like the pride and joy of cafeterias of NASA. Like, people would be like, oh, man, you guys are the JPL cafeteria is the best. Um <laughs> And of course, I mean, I feel like none of the cafeterias I've been to are actually <laughs> that exciting. Oh, he is blowing it just like you thought. Um, I also love the set decor on the whole show. Like that, yeah. that one thing I definitely really enjoyed was the, <laughs> the office decor. Yeah, yeah. Also, I'm obsessed with the fonts at NASA centers. So I always, I'm looking at this like letter on the sign, signage. I'm like, what <laughs> font is that? I don't know what this one is. 
Wait, wait, you're obsessed with fonts? Yeah, those fonts that, you know, like that are on the size of buildings, like, like you know, the Worm logo font, of course. Right. Um, or like at JPL, a lot of our font is a Neutra, N-E-U-T-R-A. Um, there, I just like really love that. It's a lot of very mid-century fonts, I think. And so I kind of love seeing what fonts the buildings like put up for their, like, you know, the United States Space Force. I don't know what font this one is, but I don't, I, 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 I gotta get into them for a while. I'm like, oh, what font is this? <laughs> like, I, obviously you've never seen a sign that's in Comic Sans. Like no one's putting any United <laughs> space, space Force in Comic Sans. So you think we'll be ready by November? Sorry. So this part, I like that he has, they're talking about the big button they have to push for the launching and he just like puts his foot on it. Yeah. Like, that's how it is. And you're like, we need launch covers. So I've never been in the control room for an actual launch. What What's the button? Is there a button or is it like a bunch of buttons you have to press simultaneously? How do you launch a satellite? I mean, everything I've seen has been computer, keyboard and mouse nowadays at this point. Um, so we are the only buttons that I have sort of seen around the lab are often stop buttons um, where <laughs> you're worried about mechanical damage or something else and you need to run and smash something that will basically kill a system very quickly, but uh -huh. never a button to like just start a system to do anything. Those are always, you know, like some set of commands. And in fact, right, if you only send one of the commands, nothing will happen. You have to send typically multiple commands, like an override and then a enable and then a, you know, whatever command so that it's very deliberate by the time that you get to, to do something. Um, that makes sense. Oh, I would also imagine there's no like real time go for these, right? That it's a countdown. So, that, you know, um, you watch the rockets, they go internal, right? At some point where they're, they're basically taking over their own countdown, but you could still send in a don't, don't go or whatever, for whatever reason you needed to. How nervous were you? when you guys were getting ready to launch? Pretty nervous. I think the way we do kind of like look at risk, right? Rockets are still one of the, the single scariest moment in a mission's life because you haven't had no chance, of course, to prove your own mission yet. Um, and rockets are just still, even though they're much, much, much more um, safe nowadays than they were you know, 30 years ago, uh, they're still one of the like, if you have to you know, boil it down to a single moment where you're most likely to lose the mission, it's, it's very typically the, the launch part. And it was weird because I was in, you know, I was in the mission control at JPL as opposed to a lot of the team was able to go to Florida to watch the actual rocket launch. Um, right. So we were still watching it on the screen and like everybody else, kind of the same, you know, YouTube feed that everybody else got to watch, which is, right. you know, you know, makes you, you know, makes people out there feel better. I guess the nice thing is that when you watch Perseverance launch in July, I guess, of this year, uh, it'll be fun that, you know, it's the same experience that they'll have in Mission Control at, uh, at JPL. Five, four, three, two, one. Main engine start, zero. And liftoff of the Atlas V with curiosity, seeking clues to the planetary puzzle about life on Mars. Was there anything superstitious that you or any of the other engineers or scientists would do to ensure a good launch? Yeah, so I mean, J I don't know if this is a loaded question or you know the answer, but JPL has a tradition actually of lucky peanuts. Oh, I and, don't know this. Oh, okay, great. Uh, so in the 1960s, um, one of the, the earlier missions that JPL did for space exploration was called the Ranger missions, and they were these sort of uh, missiles, really, I mean, almost glorified missiles, they were satellites, but they were these uh, satellite systems that were designed with a camera, basically, you know, an antenna, uh, solar panels, right? And what they were doing is they were going to the moon, taking basically images of the surface of the moon until they would just smash into the moon. So nothing like no soft landings, nothing like that. It was just the idea is take as many pictures as you could before you crashed into it and send them back to earth. Hmm. Um, the idea being that they would give you a uh, resolution of the moon at a, like a local level that you couldn't do with remote observation, right? So like with our telescopes from the earth, you can't really tell, for example, what the local terrain would look like for a, a, an Apollo lander, right? You can't be like, is it going to be jagged, sharp rocks everywhere? Is it, you know, billowy, soft sand everywhere? You know, you name it. 
As the technology of man in space was developing, it became more and more apparent that our knowledge of the moon's surface as a possible landing site was not sufficient. To land man safely on the moon and get him safely off again, we had to know whether we could set up a precise enough trajectory to reach the moon. Could we design and build a spacecraft to land gently on the moon? Among all those lunar craters, could we find a place clear and level enough for a safe landing site? To make it possible for a man to land in the Apollo zone on the moon, better pictures were needed than those taken through Earth's best telescopes. In fact, better pictures might do more than find a landing site for Apollo. Scientists hoped they might resolve questions unanswered in the 300 years since Copernicus prompted Galileo to study the moon. What were the lunar craters Galileo observed? Ranger was designed simply to hit the moon. Before it crashed into its lunar impact point, it would send back to Earth close-up TV pictures of a portion of the moon's surface. Um, so Rangers 1 through 6 actually all failed. And they failed oh. like rockets blew, were blowing up at the time. Um, some of them were successful, but the rocket engine burned, I think, for the wrong duration. And so it put us in the wrong trajectory. Um, so like we missed the moon, basically. Um, right, you have ones where the mission is successful, but the camera doesn't work. Um, so long story short, you know, there's like this kind of now six in a row of bad mission, like bad launches. And for the seventh one, I think people were obviously at that point just like either a little bit of giving up hope as well as just a lot of anxiety because they're like, well, we think we fixed all the problems, but you know, how many times can you fail before somebody's like, you are canceled. You yeah. cannot, you cannot be given missions anymore. Um, and so one of the managers had brought in peanuts uh, for people to just kind of like munch on stuff or do something kind of like to, to quell anxiety um, during Ranger 7. And sure enough, Ranger 7 was successful. And so since then, every mission that we've done, people eat Lucky Peanuts for all of the major like events. So launch, Lucky Peanuts. Um, landings, obviously Lucky Peanuts. Orbit <laughs> insertion around the planet, Lucky Peanuts. Uh, I mean, we probably have taken it to the extreme, like first time, trajectory correction maneuver, lucky peanuts. Um, <laughs> but like that's kind of become JPL's uh, thing now, right? And in fact, like we're even introducing it to some of the local uh, air area folks. So like the Rose Bowl committee now eats lucky peanuts before the Rose Bowl parade. Um, so it's kind of a neat, it's a neat thing. Um, but it's definitely part of like a very JPL tradition. I haven't heard of any of the centers doing the same thing. So I think that's just us. Yeah, no, I haven't heard of that either. Um... When you say lucky peanuts, are they any peanuts that you they're call any lucky? Peanuts. Oh, yeah, okay. they're any peanuts. They're just lucky because they're peanuts that we're eating during that activity. That's funny. <laughs> so also, um, I mean, I only know what I've read from articles, but your mohawk is pretty infamous. Was that based off of, I mean, that wasn't a superstition necessarily. That was just no. like a thing that you did with your team. Yeah, uh, so a few years before launch, we started going through uh, just a series of big milestones, right? Like you have like these first tests of the integrated system and you have um, dress rehearsals for, for launches and landings. And uh, for whatever reason, I, I think on one of the first system tests, I decided to just write like, you know, ST1 or something on the side of my head. Uh, and then it became sort of a thing where for the milestones, I would like, do a different design or pattern or whatever. Um, and obviously then it, when it came to landing, I think there was, it was very much expected that I was gonna do something. Uh, so for, I think for launch, actually I colored my hair. It was kind of a, uh, like a red to yellow, kind of like uh, ombre. So to look like a sort of a, ro a rocket plume. Um, but for landing, uh, my boss actually sent out an email with like one of those like, survey monkey poles in it and was like, what should Bob X hair look like for landing? And I think the options were like, one of them was shave my head. Uh, there was red for Mars. Um, there was red, white, and blue. Um, I, can't, I think there was one other, two other. Oh, there was, a, I think a reverse mohawk was one of them. So shave out the middle and grow the sides long. Uh -huh. um, at the end, red, white, and blue one. So I put that in there. So I had like the white stars and the red and blue little tufts in the, I would have loved to see one of the engineers in that room have a mohawk 
because you knew you know that they're going to be trying to like impersonate you that I would have just died if that happened that would have been great <laughs> I'd be there was a casting call once for some show where they were like they used me as the example they were like guy who looks kind of like the mohawk guy from curiosity landing or whatever <laughs> oh, this is amazing <laughs> was it a space show I think it was a space show. I think they they were looking for more of a, a SpaceX vibe. I think if, the, if I remember what else I read in that that uh, um, that casting, it was very short, of course. Um, but yeah. but they were specifically cited cited me as the example of who they were looking for, and I was like, well, that's flattering. <laughs> All right, this I feel like was the most Michael Scott moment of the yes, series. <laughs> absolutely. This is also how I know I could not be an actor is seeing scenes like this where I'm like, I cannot ever be this like comfortable in front of a camera. Like this uh, is amazing to me. I, when I watch people sort of like willingness to do this in front of the camera, I'm like, I, this is how I know I'm not meant to be an actor. <laughs> I don't know. It depends uh, what paycheck they're giving you. I feel like if it was high enough, I would do. That's true. A lot of things. <laughs> That's true. You know, the mission controls for for our places, I feel like, aren't as cool as they are in the movies. No. Um, and they always look great in the movie, but it's also funny because I don't think, like, historically they've always been meant to be practical, but they kind of look cool back in the day because they were darker. Um, and now, like, we've gone full circle where now we're trying to sort of create mission controls that look more like the movie's <laughs> mission controls. Like it's a full circle where we were the cool ones inspiring the movies and now we're like, oh, what are the movies doing for mission control? Let's do more stuff like that. <laughs> I will say the Wallops mission control room is pretty cool. And I think it looks, because they have where the two generals were looking up top, they do have mm -hmm. that at Wallops. Okay. But I mean, this is right. This is the reality. We're mostly just looking at computer screens now. <laughs> I mean, that's... I've heard one of the most fun things about launches is like the after launch parties. Uh, are there parties? Are they fun? What are they like? I mean, I was working, so I don't know. I don't feel like I had an after launch party. Wait, so uh, what'd you do after launch? I went home. I mean, I was like, oh, I'm tired. I've been up for so many hours. Um, no, really, I think like, let's see, I didn't. So I mean, there was a, so for landing, after landing, there was a big celebration. Um, but like launch, I feel, I mean, launch was obviously was so interesting right, for launch because we're the payload. I think we were just like, oh, now is our, we're working, right? Like now we got to get control of the spacecraft and like communicate and, you know, make sure everything is healthy after launch. Uh, I don't know if the folks at Florida who are out there just kind of more in the like spectator capacity, mm -hmm. they probably had a great time. Like they probably went on <laughs> and celebrated. Um, Oh, but I think I for see. those of us, like I was on console and then it was time to go. I was like, I'm really tired because I didn't sleep well the night before also, right? I was just very right, like, right. anxious for the launch. Yeah. Right. And then what's it like the next day when you wake up and you're like, huh, I just launched my payload yesterday and now today's just another normal day. Yeah, it was, I, it was weird because it was just a, all right, shift start. You know, we have the morning tag up at 8 a.m. or whatever and go in and work for, you know, but like, it, but it's cool because you're like, I am now sending commands to a spacecraft in space, right? Like the change was like, oh, everything I've done right now is kind of like practice. And now here we are, like this command that we're about to send or this telemetry I'm looking at is from a vehicle that is now in space. Um, and I think that novelty lasts for a couple of days. And then you're like, oh, this is a job. It's just a job, <laughs> which is, it's still exciting. But like, you know, you're um, from the routine perspective, it's, it's, no longer novel and then it's very you know the exciting parts are really just about oh today we're going to turn on this device for the first time you know does everybody really understand what the you know what the activity of the day is going to be what could go wrong with that activity you know that kind of briefing stuff right um, right yeah all right we're at the last scene now this last scene makes me laugh because it's just so ridiculous uh the high resolution oh, or like yeah. how well you can see the satellite. I know that is a giant satellite. Just... And then like an even bigger satellite comes along. <laughs> Look how much bigger it is. That <laughs> solar panel compared to this one. Yeah. 
I also love that the dynamics is like this, like it can just chug on in and then chug away um, as if that's actually a thing that is possible in space. But um, that's like, that kind of stuff is like very, I mean, there are cases where we know now satellites have spied on other satellites or gotten very close to other satellites um, within a couple hundred meters, I think. Um, but that is still pretty difficult to do. And you know it's happening because you see the orbits of those two things getting closer and closer and closer until they're um, there. You can't just like boop, 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 move in and then like drive away. Like there's no <laughs> physics like that in space. Um, but yeah. That also, is... someone, somebody would know that satellite exists. Anything that large is a very obvious satellite in the sky. Right. Um, you might not know the answer to this question, but if you see, I mean, so I know for space junk, we can, can you, how well can you steer a satellite in space? So like, let's say you see something coming really close to you, whether it's space junk or another spacecraft, you can just move away from it or is that not how things work? Uh, so kind of, um, so there is, uh, NORAD tracks, I think all objects greater than eight centimeters in diameter. Um, so the size of a grapefruit roughly. Um, so when you, once you know that, you, you know, the, the way they're not constantly looking at every object, right? They're, they're checking objects and then creating a profile of what its orbit looks like, right? So once you, you know, once you gather enough data points, you know exactly because, right, the physics is fairly determinate, you know exactly where it's going to be in orbit. And then every so often you just come by and double check it to make sure that it's the, you know, the prediction, the model that you have for its orbit is the same. And of course, it you know as it gets closer to the atmosphere, it starts burn, you know kind of slowing down and moving, falling into Earth faster and faster. So we see that all the time, right? Where satellites have to perform avoidance maneuvers. Um, usually, you have a little over 24 hours to do that. Um, oh. Often days in advance, but it's like space station, for example, has to do it often in pretty short notice. Hmm. And what they do is, you know, you know, it doesn't take much basically, but a few hours out, you know, 12 hours out or so, um, if you just fire your thrusters a little bit, you either you know raise your orbit or lower your orbit. And 12 hours later, right, the impact of that is a fairly large change. Even though instantaneously you're only moving a very small amount, right. you're really changing your speed, right? So that if I change my speed by ever so little, you know, but I do it 12 hours in advance, the difference in distance is fairly large. Um, so that's how they basically track those. But, you know, where humans are involved, it's, of course, hugely critical that you do that um, in a safe way. Um, for the other satellites, we still do it, uh, right? We have these basically collision avoidance maneuvers and you, you know, for, for everyone that you see where you have a known object, they, they, there's like a warning, right? Where they tell you, hey, you're, I don't know, you have a one in 2000 chance of impact with this object, you know, if you don't do anything. And then you slightly, you know, move your orbit up or down um, a little bit just to kind of get it out of the same path. And then you're like, okay, now the probability is one in 30,000. And you're like, okay, that's good. <laughs> Oh, I mean, okay. it's not one in one chance, right? You don't like we n almost never see a, a oh, you have a hundred percent chance of collision. Right. It's right. always something like you have a you know a, a ten percent chance, which is like if you then if you think about how many times you're going to see that over the mission, you'd be like, oh, if I never did anything, I would be very likely that eventually I'll smash into something. Oh. Um, right. Like, so that's I mean, like that's the thing, right? You're you're basically if you think about it, it's like a, a series of very small probabilities that if you let's say blatantly ignored the problem forever um, for 10 years or whatever, right? That eventually, because you have 1% chances, you know, thousands of times, you're eventually going to, right? The odds are you're going to hit one of those 1% chances. Um, but at any given moment, it's not like, oh, you're on a collision course with this satellite. You know, the way they show that one, of course, you can't just move that quickly. You tend to, <laughs> if you get a satellite up there, you know, and somebody wants to come visit that satellite for whatever reason, it's usually if they weren't already in a very close orbit, uh, which would basically be like somebody also launching from the same place so that you have mm -hmm. the same kind of track um, or same angle, uh, then you really are going to spend days, if not, you know, weeks or months, like maneuvering your orbit, right? Because if you try to do like what they did is you're burning a ton of fuel to catch up, get close, and then a ton of fuel to move away like that. Like that kind of fuel is the problem is like you don't want to spend fuel. Um, those are very, it's very expensive because you can only have so much fuel on board of a mission. Mm -hmm. And so the way you do it cheaply, right, is when we're talking about like the 12 hours in advance, just takes a very tiny change in momentum 12 hours in advance to give you a very large distance thing. Um, if you want to really change your orbit to match somebody else, you plan it months in advance so that you'll be, you know, three months from now in the same orbit as this other satellite. Oh. So and that way what you I... use a very small amount of fuel. Oh, okay. 
that makes that makes uh, sense. And <laughs> I feel like for <laughs> these kind of shows that are you either have to be really yeah. close to what might be possible, or you have to be completely outlandish like this. So right. that way, people are like, "Oh, they clearly know this would never happen." <laughs> right. Cool. All right. Well, hopefully, um, this served as a good audition tape for you. So yeah. we'll ask you to be on season two now. That's right. Please invite yeah. me to season two. Uh, at least just to the writer's room, tell you about my weird space experiences. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you very much, Bobak. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah. This is our review of the first episode of Space Force. Thank you for joining us. Next episode, we talk to primate expert Natalia Reagan about monkeys in space as we review the second episode, Save Epsilon 6. I'm your host, Kasha Patel, and special thank you to our guest, Bobak Ferdowsi. Comment below if you have a question and subscribe to my YouTube channel.